Hey everyone, you're tuned in to the Founder Hour podcast. I'm your co-host, Pat, and on today's episode, we sit down with Daniel Arsham. Daniel is a contemporary artist based in New York City whose work exists in between art, architecture, and performance. His company, Snarkitecture, has truly pushed the boundaries of what's possible with architectural design, some of which includes designing the stores for streetwear brand Kith. His past collaborations include Merce Cunningham, Pharrell Williams, and Adidas, and most recently, he was named creative director of the Cleveland Cavaliers. If you haven't had a chance to check out his work, I highly recommend going to danielarsham.com or checking it out on Instagram at danielarsham. During our conversation, we did a deep dive into Daniel's upbringing and how he became interested in the arts, how he's been able to build such a long and successful career as an artist, his thoughts on talent versus hard work, how he feels about education and design schools, what has made the biggest impact on his work, the things he still hopes to achieve in the future, and much more. Here we go. Yes, I was, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, um, moved to Miami when I was quite young. Uh, grew up in Miami, but not really the Miami that people know and think about now. Um, kind of out more towards the, the swamp. Um, and, you know, I, I was really interested in photography as a kid and basketball. Um, ended up studying. I had a fourth grade teacher who told my parents that uh, I was good at drawing, which at that point I probably was not, but um, and that sort of led me on a path to study in magnet schools, which were like focused um, in particular areas of art. So I, I had a photography um, focused education uh, starting in fifth grade, mm-hmm. um, was shooting on film, developing my own film, you know, printing in the darkroom and went on to study um, even in junior high school uh, in photography and sort of developed an interest in architecture largely through a lot of the photos that I was taking were of um, specific elements of architecture and also uh, went through this very bad hurricane that was in uh, in Florida in 1992 and heavily documented uh, the the destruction after the, the destruction aftermath of my house that we were in as well as the reconstruction uh, of that house you know being basically built back to exactly the way that it was before. Um, studying, you documented this? Yeah, I document. I mean, I took a lot of photos around that time. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not many of them survived the, the multiple moves after that, but I've got about 15 or 20 images from that period that, are, um, that were printed. I lost the original negatives. Yeah. Wow. Daniel, how did, how did photography make you feel? I mean, as a fifth grader, you're, a lot of people aren't really concerned with you know, extracurricular activities per se, especially photography, but, you know, what, what, what sort of joy or what sort of emotion did that bring you? Uh, this was like pre cell phone era, you know, this is like hit my beeper era with the, like, you know, <laughs> the, the coded message, um, on the beeper. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the first camera that I had was a Pentax K1000, um, which is this beautiful object has interchangeable lenses. Um, it was given to me by my, by my grandfather. Um, I think it was like for my 11th birthday and that introduction to photography, he was also kind of like an amateur photographer, um, himself and, you know, always had a camera around his neck. Uh, and I sort of thought about it as a way to, you know, it was a hobby. It was a way to see the world. It was a way to document things that were happening. Um, yeah, it w- it didn't feel like an extracurricular activity, you know? It felt just like kind of part of everyday life, like the same right. way that I was playing basketball at the time. Right. How much of that reassurance, I guess, that you got or that affirmation that you got when you were a kid and you said your fourth grade teacher said you were good at drawing and kind of those, those signals that you got made it easier, I guess, for you to... F- commit to something or just like stick to something, even though you felt like you, maybe you weren't that great at it, but other people saw it in you. Was that something that like weighed heavily in your mind when you were trying to decide what to focus on and do, or, or was that something that you were like, ah, eh, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I certainly, not that I felt like I had something to live up to, but they had given me the, the opportunity to do that. So I, I felt like there was at least, um, 
the pressure to to follow through with it, I guess. I, probably that came more from my grandfather than it did from, you know, my my teacher, but um, it was more just like an introduction to something that I enjoyed and that I liked doing, and I was, you know, grateful for that. The reason I ask is because, you know, I feel like there are a lot of folks when they're younger, perhaps they show signs of something, you know, they're, they're good at drawing or they're good at playing basketball or, or what, what have you, but maybe they just don't get the affirmation from the people around them um, saying like, this is something that maybe you should pursue. Like you, you should take this more seriously. Like you're really good at this compared to other people I've seen. And for whatever reason, they don't get that. And, and, and that just that passion or that innate talent just sort of fades out. Or maybe it's just always there, but they don't act on it. And so I just wonder how how big of a role it played when it, you know, as you when you were a kid. Like, did you have other? Th- were you ever confused? Like, did you have other things in your mind that you think I could do this or I could do that, or were you like, this is my path right now? Of, yeah, I think part of the thing is that I never really believed in this idea of talent, you know, where, where or inherent talent, because I still. You know, I, I can do certain things very well, but it took me literally 30 years to be able to draw as well as I can now. I certainly couldn't do that in fourth grade. Um, and so that I don't feel um, when people say, oh, you're super talented. I'm like, no, I spent 30 years learning how to do this and mm. failing many, many times at it. Um, so it's almost like when people say you have talent, it negates all the hard work that was put in to actually achieve that thing. Right. Um, and I, for, for people, you know, sometimes I'll be doing a lecture and people will ask like, you know, how do you decide what the focus of your, your life's work should be or, or that you, um, that you feel like you should dive into this area. And I kind of feel like it doesn't really matter what you do. If you just pick one thing that you have some level of interest in and go like full on into that thing, instead of trying to, you know, parse out many different opportunities, um, eventually you'll get there. Daniel, don't you think that, you know, that's easier said than done, right? I feel like a lot of people perhaps think that they are good at one thing or interested in one thing, uh, but they're almost afraid of just pursuing that, whether it's as a result of FOMO, whether it's a result of fear that it may not pan out, right? At what point do you pursue it and then think to yourself, well, am I there yet? Like, am I quote unquote successful? Has this thing panned out? Right. Like, when do you know that this was the right thing to do? No person who has any kind of entrepreneurial spirit ever feels like they have been successful entirely. There's always another thing to achieve. And I think that, you know, building um, building my work in the way that I have, you know, it's a little bit of a looking back moment for me because the first real exhibitions that I had, you know, I just turned 40. The first shows that I had were 20 years ago now which in some ways feels like ages ago. And in another way, it's not really that long ago. It was 2001 was my first actual, what I felt like was a kind of real art exhibition. And part of it is just like the decision to do that. And, you know, frankly, it's a, it's a tough thing to say, but not everyone is going to be successful in that. And part of it is the willingness to commit to that thing and feel in some ways like a failure for many, many years. You know, I literally lived in the studio until 2010, like couldn't afford a a separate apartment, lived in the studio. I was having exhibitions, certainly, but like wasn't really like making it, you know, Mm -hmm. in in the way that I I do feel like now I've established a certain path and um, I, I kind of see things more clearly about where they can go. But when you when you were in fifth grade and doing the photography, did you think to yourself at all, like, this is something I always want to keep doing. Perhaps this is something I want to pursue, uh, you know, beyond high school and college professionally. Or, I mean, I, I mean, I know you ended up pursuing it, but uh, tell me how, what you were thinking about. I mean, in some ways, you know, my parents were very supportive in my interest in the arts, but they also were sort of, I would say, pushing a little bit more towards the practical aspects of a career that could be had in those fields. So like graphic design and architecture, those were areas I think that for them felt like, okay, you can actually build a career in that versus being a visual artist is um, there's so few that actually can, can, can build a career on that. So 
I thought at a certain point that I would study architecture and, you know, I'd be an architect, but um, that, that quickly um, became a, a, a non-starter when all of the math and the precision that's involved in architecture um, be, became really outside of my, my wheelhouse. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this because going back to what you said, which I agree with, you know, it's like people think, you know, something talent is something that you're necessarily like completely just born with and it didn't take, you know, a long time to work on that talent and get to where you are. But do you think that every human being has this really strong, like creative side that they could create, I mean, amazing art, like the way you do, but they just don't they're not in tune with it as much as they can can be. And perhaps for whatever reason, societal pressures or whatever, they just kind of go in the other way, the other route of just like not really being very creative in whatever they're doing, but um, suppressing that side in a way. Like, do you think that's true? I believe that any person could do exactly what I have done if they're willing to spend 30 years figuring it out and committing to it like completely and failing probably for, you know, the first 20 years of that. And it's not that you, it's not that anyone can't do that. It's about the decision to, to do that. Um, mm. I was talking with somebody yesterday about, um, this was actually more related to, to basketball, but um, something that a professor had said to me at some point, which is um, this idea that craft is something that we're all expected to know how to do. So when we're kids in school, like anyone can draw and paint pictures and, you know, make crafts, right? But art is the unexpected use of craft. It's mm. the, the acceleration of it or, or the compression of it into something that becomes elevated beyond what all of us can do. And a lot of that sometimes has to just do with time and commitment to it. Right. It's kind of like you can't necessarily picture the end result at all times, but it's like just by doing it something come, come, come out of it and perhaps you don't see it. Uh, you, maybe you don't use you, you yourself as the artist or the creator. You, maybe you don't even appreciate it as much as someone else might. So you just never know in a way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess when was the, I, I, was it a moment or I guess what happened? Like you were on this path, you were doing photography. And then when did you decide, like, I guess this is going to be like my future. I mean, I'm going to do art and I'll figure out other things and, like, was there, was there like a moment or like, what, it, what, did you have any other path that you were on or was that it? There was no specific single moment. There was many, uh, you know, culminations of moments. So I studied, um, at a school in Miami called design and architecture, senior high school and studied architecture there and painting. And I applied to a number of different colleges um, initially, I was not accepted to Cooper Union. I was put on the wait list and eventually um, uh, was accepted, came to New York. And, you know, the first year of, of art school, pretty much any um, college level art school in the U.S. at least, the core curriculum for the first year is the same. It's, mm. it's two-dimensional design, color theory, um, three-dimensional design, and your basic like art history course. And so throughout that year, you're meant to sort of pick a focus. And because Cooper was more open, I was able to study painting and sculpture. And I actually primarily focused in painting when I was at school. Um, most of the people that know my work today is probably through sculpture, uh, but that was the real origin of the practice. And when I finished school, I uh, moved back to Miami um, and with a group of friends, you know, in sort of thinking about how do you go from being a student to exhibiting your work in galleries or museums, they don't teach you that in school. There's no real understanding of how you would actually go about doing that other than making your work and trying to get it seen. So we opened our own gallery. Um, it was called The House, and it was literally inside of a gutted house, <laughs> um, very close to Wynwood uh, in Miami. and that group of, of people, that, that group of artists, um, many of them, you know, w went on to have careers uh, based on that initial uh, exposure that we had through building this, uh, this entity. How much of where you were at the time, you know, Wynwood, Miami, obviously it's a very artistic uh, you know, city and there's a lot of just like, yeah, you know, art, we have Art Basel there. Um, how much of being there, I, I guess, helped you showcase your work and get your work out? 
as opposed to if you were somewhere else, like in the middle of like Arkansas or something? I would say hugely. Um, you know, the cliche of being in the right place at the right time. Certainly, I probably would have tried to find my path if I was in somewhere else. But my move back to Miami coincided with uh, Art Basel mm. starting in Miami, which meant that there was a huge influx of curators, gallerists, you know, museum directors from around the world that were in Miami, some of which they had never been to Miami. And they understood that there, there was this kind of burgeoning art scene that was happening there with a lot of younger students. And it wasn't unusual for us to have studio visits with pretty significant curators of the time. And that's actually how I was first introduced to Emmanuel Periton, um, who's been my, my gallerist um, really since, since 2003 was the first project with him. Daniel, on a, I guess a more general note, uh, whether it was photography or painting or you know the work that you started doing in the early 2000s, what were you inspired by, right? I mean, or, or what were some of the things, I guess, that inspired you in your work and your practice? So the other thing that, you know, art school is meant to draw out of you is what is the work going to be about? Um, what is the, what is the subject matter? And right. I think um, certainly for, for many, you know, younger artists, the, the depth of experience that is needed to produce, I would say, you know, pieces that can be more profound is, is not quite there. Um, so I made work about things that I was just interested in. There was, I was interested in architecture. I was interested in um, science fiction. Um, and the first works that I made at that time were these paintings of uh, caverns and icebergs that contained like buildings within them. And they, they could be like a futuristic landscape or, you know, they also looked like things that could have been from the past. They, in that way, they kind of floated in time. And those were really the first works that sort of um, that were seen by by other people and led to um, some of the exhibitions that I had uh, shortly after school. When it comes to like the approach to art, you know, some t- some folks are more abstract, some are some are more like kind of just direct. Like when you were kind of trying to get your work noticed, or I don't know, even know if you were actually putting a lot of effort into it, and if, if it just came naturally. But like, did you feel like you had to really explain all this stuff to people, or did you? Did, was it just kind of you're doing what you feel like you want to do and people are taking notice and appreciating it for what it is and you didn't have to do too much of like, hey, like look at what I'm making here type of thing? I mean, part of it has to do with the school that I went to, which was a very conceptual, heavy, thought-focused um, institution. And following school, I did feel that I had to justify the rationale behind the work much more so than I feel like I have to now. Like now I just make, well, I did then too, but I just make whatever I want and like people can like it or just not. And it doesn't really matter to me. I feel like the pressure of trying to justify um, the purpose behind the work and why it was made. And maybe that's, that's good that I had to kind of go through that. But um, I think that it can be a crutch for a lot of young artists because you're, you're forced to justify something into um, words, really. Uh, and in many cases, the purpose of art is to communicate without those things. So there's a little bit of a um, conflict happening there. Hmm. So going back to the early 2000s, you're in Miami, you're doing all this stuff. Talk to us a little bit about you know, how your career progressed from there. So 2000, it was either 2001 or 2002, I met uh, Emmanuel Periton in Miami. Um, we were introduced through uh, a, a, a collector in Miami who ha- had already purchased a couple of my drawings. And he came um, to the house. He saw what was happening there and invited a group of us to have an, uh, an exhibition in Paris the following year. Um, so that was um, 2001 was the first um, sort of major museum project that I had. It wasn't until 2003 that I did the exhibition in Paris with Emmanuel. And two years later, after that, um, we started to work together in a more formal um, relationship. So my first um, solo exhibition uh, with him was in Paris in 2005. 
And I would say it was a little bit of a slow beginning. I certainly, you know, I was showing alongside artists like Takashi Murakami, um, Maurizio Catalan, you know, these artists who had made their career in the 90s, uh, who were already globally famous and mm -hmm. exhibiting in museums everywhere. And I was this 25 year old kid that, you know, at that point, I was probably 10 years younger than any artist in the gallery. Right. So there was a little bit of like <laughs> catching up feeling. Um, and also in some ways a feeling that at least with Emmanuel, that he was not, not like he was doing me a favor, but that he was supporting work that didn't necessarily fund the gallery. You know, it's almost like he sure. used the reason that he had from, from Takashi and, and the other artists to actually build a younger audience. And, you know, to his credit, I mean, he, he started working with Takashi very early with Maurizio. He, you know, the first exhibition that Damien Hirst had outside of, of, um, of the UK was with Emmanuel in Paris in 1989. Mm -hmm. So he certainly has a, an ability to identify, you know, um, younger artists. And he always told me that part of the reason that he selects artists is that he sees the possibility for evolution of, of an artist's work over time. You know, some artists, especially coming out of school, there's a body of work that doesn't evolve. And that part of the evolution is critical to an artist actually having a longer career. I was going to actually ask you, because that's an interesting point you bring up is, you know, when you see an artist's career and like a long career, like a Murakami or what have you, Hearst, they, have you noticed that they have to kind of readjust just their everything like aesthetic or just like approach or everything along the way so it doesn't get like mundane or people don't get like it doesn't get old i guess like people don't get sick of their aesthetic or is that something that you think uh is not is not as common for you know artists that have long yeah and i think what happens is um and i'm just starting to like kind of understand this in my own work as well that there are like periods of work that define a certain aesthetic and you feel at the time that like that is what you're known for, but that entire uh, entity that that universe can actually shift ten ten years later. So if we think about in the beginning of my the first works that I showed, you know, with Emmanuel, were all paintings, and so for the period from 2005 to 2010, really, the primary vehicle for people seeing my work was in painting, and that's kind of what I was known for at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, then it shifted to uh, sculptural work that was architectural in nature. So the pieces that I've made that actually um, integrate into the architecture, like a clock kind of falling down a wall or a knot being tied in a corner, that was a, a kind of aesthetic universe that I built and, I, and was known for. Um, and then after that, there is this whole universe of um, future relics and fictional archaeology that, that I've built. So I think that the same is true for, um, if you look at, let's say the arc of like Takashi's work. Maurizio is a little bit of a, of a wild card because he, he never really had a, an aesthetic necessarily that defined him. It was much more a conceptual, uh, conceptually driven practice. Um, but Takashi, I think you can find these periods of his work, um, but everything has this through line through it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And on that point, because I, I had seen your complex blueprint um, episode, which was an amazing episode, and you talk about kind of you know um, how the stuff you're working on now are things that you know the public is going to see years from now, you know three, four, five years from now. And so, does that ever cross your mind? Like, this is my aesthetic now. This is what I'm working on now. But what it, uh, the world could be a totally different place, and maybe like, what if they don't appreciate it at the time? Yeah. Or I mean, do you not care? Like, it's just this is what I'm doing now, and it is what it is. I mean, at some point, uh, you know, as an artist, you have to just learn that um, there's always going to be an audience that either passively doesn't like your work or like actively is like not about it. Mm -hmm. And that's just part of the game. And it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to like absorb and feel. Um, but the way that I rationalize that is like, I don't like everything, you know, there's like tons of work that, I mean, I would say like, um, there's a lot of bad work bad artwork in the world but all of it's good right it, it all serves a kind of purpose and it and it fits different aesthetics and means different things to different people so 
I don't know if that totally answers the question, but no, it makes it's yeah, it's it's just I was just curious to hear your thoughts on that. But yeah, um, Daniel, one thing I'm curious about, um, and I'm not trying to general generalize here. So if my if it comes across as a generalization, my intent is not. But I view a lot of artists like I view engineers, right? Software engineers specifically, or even like hardware engineers. I mean, the true geniuses, the true creatives behind a product or a work, right? And a lot of times, again, this is not a generalization, but a lot of times those folks aren't necessarily building something for the aspect of marketability or for the aspect of saleability, right? They're just building what they believe is a great piece of work, a great piece of product, a great piece of art, whatever the case may be. When you were starting off and building your career as an artist, was that something you were thinking about, the business aspect of art? Or were you just focused on developing your aesthetic, your own personal brand, and that's about it? I mean, I, without dodging the question, I would say it was a little bit of both. You know, my, my father is a banker and my mother's a lawyer. <laughs> so that aspect of like really understanding that in order to have a functioning business, um, you know, there has to be income coming from somewhere. Right. And I, I would say early on decisions like literally living in my studio for five years um, with no kitchen, there was no shower here. I, I literally went to the gym to, to go shower. Um, those kinds of decisions were made in order to progress the, the work and be able to make things that I did feel eventually would command, you know, um, some desire and, and people would be interested in purchasing them. Um, it was a slow going, I think in the beginning and I filled in with, you know, I worked for many years between, um, 2006 and, and 2011 as, uh, the stage designer for Merce Cunningham dance company. And, you know, that sort of carried me through, um, those years, which was, wasn't a, like a full-time position or a steady job in that way, but. Um, it was a different source of, of income that allowed me to pursue some of these other things. And were your parents okay with you? Pers- or I guess it didn't really matter if they were okay or not, but like, were they at all disappointed in your career choice and thought maybe, Daniel, you know, you should follow our path, you know, go become an investment banker or, you know, doctor or lawyer or something where, you know, you're producing a steady income or were they just from the get go um, fully behind what you wanted to pursue? I mean, to their credit, given their backgrounds and, and their uh, careers of choice, um, they were super supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Um, I mean, they weren't supporting me financially. Right. Sort of case, <laughs> in that way, I was on my own. Yeah. But emotionally, and, you know, uh, they, were, they were backing me up with it. And um, that was extremely helpful for sure. And I think that's a big thing, right, for any entrepreneur is that, you know, even if whether it's your parents, your close friends, family members, et cetera, even if they aren't supporting you financially, just the fact that they're quote unquote behind you, right? You know, yeah. they're supporting the fact that you're doing it. You know, keep going, right? You have entrepreneurial you have an entrepreneurial spirit, exercise that, right? You I feel like you you've said the word practice a lot, right? It's not about it's 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 about practice, right? Whether it's art, whether it's a business, whether it's a sport, you're constantly practicing. You're not you're not there yet. You're constantly trying to get better, right? But if you have a team behind you or with you who's supporting those efforts, it's a lot easier to stay positive, to keep going, to stay motivated. And I feel like for an artist, that's even more important considering that a lot of people don't view art from the get-go as a business if they're in that field. They just pursue it because they truly love it. I mean, that's definitely true. And I think part of the thing for me, you know, is I've always tried to surround myself with people who I felt were more successful than I was. Um, and a lot of my friends are, you know, in, in business and have, and have built up their own businesses that are not in art, you know, whether they're in architecture or, um, you know, Ronnie Feig is a good friend of mine from Kith or Teddy, um, Chris Stamp, all of, they're like entrepreneurs in their own right. And them watching the way that they've developed those things, you know, it, it pushes all of us together to, to, yeah. And Ronnie's been on the show as well too. Right. It sounds like you uh, you really had a good experience um, going to design school and art school, uh, Cooper Union. And um, I'm curious, like, if you think that that is a necessary thing when it comes to uh, understanding the fundamentals of art and design and 
if you would recommend it to younger folks who you know, want to go down that path because school in general, um, obviously with other areas, like I went to business school, um, and nurses went to law school. I mean, it does a good job of a kind of like shaping you to think a certain way, but at some point it's like, you know, are we all being trained to be like robots, like to think the same way and look at life the same way? Um, right. and it's not as personalized, obviously, like it's just like kind of a one size fits all thing. Um, so I wonder when it comes to design and art, like what your thoughts are when it comes to like a structured school environment. Yeah, so I think undergraduate art education, if you want to be an artist, it's not critical, but it's it's also the not just the school, but the participation with other students and, and watching how other people build a language and, and actually like learn. Watching other people learn allows you to understand how you can do that as well, right? Um, so I'm undergraduate, I'm totally in support of. Graduate school for art, I think is just like a shakedown like it's not i i don't see the benefit in that given also how expensive it is yeah um, and you know many um friends of mine who or, or younger artists that i've known who have asked my advice with that i just think it's better to like i don't know go intern with an artist or like work for free for somebody for a year it's going to be cheaper than paying uh for graduate school for art and on that note do you have you, do you feel like as your career has progressed you've had to really be a student in so many other ways like let's say you know you were doing photography first and then you want to do canvas and then you want to do architecture and this and that like did you have to become a student again and really like approach it that way or did did it come more natural to you i never stopped being a student at all of the every time that i go into a new area of focus so when i worked with merce cunningham i had never been i wasn't trained as a stage designer i had never literally been on a stage like that um, and so learning the mechanics of that, um, even like the, the idioms in the language, like the, the way that you call the stage, you know, stage left and stage right, downstage and upstage and all of the lighting terms and um, all of these things were aspects that I had to completely relearn. Uh, same is true for, you know, the work that we do in star architecture. I'm not an architect, right? We designed all of the shops for, for Kith. Um, and I'm constantly having to learn about how those those aspect works. So I think part of the desire to get into new areas is also to continue to, you know, push and learn about those things. See, Daniel, I, I'm, what I'm curious about, honestly, is the fact that you're not stubborn, right? I think a lot of people can get stubborn in what they want to do or how they envision their life to play out. But, I mean, why did you even say yes to the opportunity of stage production, right? I mean, what did that have to do with art and painting and sculptures? I feel like most people would have said, nah, this is not for me. Why would I even do this? Well, if it was another stage design opportunity, perhaps, but Merce Cunningham, uh, being the legend that he is, it would have been impossible <laughs> in some respect to say, to say no to that. Um, it was terrifying. I will say that, um, to accept a, you know, he basically said, I'd like you to, I was 24 years old when I met him. Um, he was 84. <laughs> so 60 year, 60 year difference. The guy was an absolute legend, worked with everyone from Warhol, Rauschenberg, um, Jasper Johns, you know, all of the most famous artists of the 20th century. Yep. And he's saying to somebody who's never designed stage before. Um, never worked on that scale to basically create a stage design uh, for him for a work that was going to premiere about a year later. Um, and then the other aspect of it that I forgot to mention is the way that he worked um, was very specific to his craft in that he would separate the elements of the performance. So yeah. the dance, he would create the dance, an artist would create the stage design and a musician would create the score, but none of them would know what the other one was doing yeah. for, for that piece. So I never saw the dance before. I was creating this um, stage design for something that I didn't know what it was going to be, and I hadn't heard the music. Um, so, so that part, you know, <laughs> was certainly terrifying. But the rest of it, no, it, it was it was an obvious yes. Mm -hmm. So, and along the way, you know, with all these different things that you've done, and I know you have, you have your hands in a lot of different things now too. What is your approach to, uh, you know, agreeing to a project when an opportunity comes up? Do you, is there more than just like yeah, I feel like doing this right now, so I'll do this and I have the time and this could be good enough for me. Like, is there more of like a rigorous, like, 
analyzation process or is it is it that well i will say this following the the, the collaboration with merce and and really following you know some of the other collaborations that i've done the amount of inquiry that comes through the door like 99.9 percent of it is a no um it's stuff that either i'm just like not into what they're doing or it, it time-wise it doesn't make sense um but really it's an about an alignment and i think that early on when i you know i can remember when i when i did the first adidas uh collaboration um having some discussions with people m- more directly in the art world they were very skeptical about what that would mean to, uh you know, to work with a, a, a footwear brand like that, um, that an artist shouldn't be involved necessarily in commerce in that way, and that they would actually be using my work to advertise, you know, a sneaker. And I saw it literally the opposite way, that this massive company with a huge reach was going to spend a fortune to basically bring my work to this mass audience. So it was, it was an inverse um, proposition for me. And I've often looked at um, ways of bringing my work to audiences that are not specifically in the art world. And I think that, you know, uh, for a lot of younger people, especially the, the, the art world, if you didn't grow up in that environment, it's a, it's a little bit of a, um, like a closed door scenario. You know, when you walk into a gallery, you're not really sure what you're, you're doing there. If you're not buying something, um, you know, and my message has always been to everyone, like, Galleries are free to go to, and the reason they're free is that you don't have to buy the work when you go in there. Mm -hmm. All the other people who purchase those works pay for your experience, and that's another benefit of, you know, um, the collector base is they're literally giving the gift of of showing those works and, and allowing other people to see them. Daniel, you mentioned something earlier that I found really interesting, which was the fact that, you know, you surrounded yourself or you still surround yourself with a bunch of successful people, right? Uh, folks that are doing things in their respective industries and um, have reached a level of success that, um, you know, they've reached a lot of people, such as, you know, yourself or Ronnie uh, with Kith. You know, what is your advice to the young professionals out there, or even the older professionals that listen to this show, um, about surrounding themselves with the right people, whether or not it is in their industry? And how can they use that to then motivate themselves to go out and either create something or to partner with others to create something? I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. I mean, one thing I would say is it, it's not that I surrounded myself with successful people. I surrounded myself with driven people because in the time that I've known those people and when we all you know first met, none of us were in, in anywhere near the level of success. I mean, when I met Ronnie, it was before Kit even opened. Um, it was like after his David Z days, uh, Chris Stamp had like a website, you know, no physical store. Like, you know, maybe he had made a couple of products. Mm -hmm. Um, this was around, it would have been like 2010 probably. Um, actually I can remember there was like, there was a dinner that I think was for Ronnie's birthday. Um, this must've been. 2011 or 2012 because i think it was right after ronnie opened um and it was a dinner at kingswood ronnie's birthday and it was like chris stamp teddy was there virgil was there um i think john elliott was there like this whole group of people that have gone on to do all of these things and I, I thought back to that dinner because it was before like any of us really had done anything i mean it was, it was before virgil had even done pyrex he was still working for yay at that point and that all of those people had something in mind mm-hmm. to, to do, you know, and obviously, you know, many of them have, have built something over the last 10 years out of that. And you mentioned all these people and yeah, like you said, they've all done amazing things in their own ways and even as collaborations, but uh, you know, around the same time, obviously, while you guys are coming up, you included um, social media obviously has grown and the ability to, to showcase your work to millions of people online. Um, I would just wonder like what you think about how, how that's impacted. I guess you, you can't speak for everyone, but maybe at least for your work. Um, how, how has that impacted your ability to share your art with the world? And do you think that, um, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm sure it's a good thing, but I guess maybe we'll hear your thoughts on it. 
it's obviously a game changer for, for artists and the ability to not only reach audiences that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do it, but to actually control the means of distribution of their work. So before, the only vehicle to do that was directly through the gallery, right? The gallery was the Instagram of, you know, the past where people would go to see work right. out the gallery in museums. And those people were literally like the gatekeepers of this closed ecosystem that when I finished school, I had no idea how to enter that. It literally felt like a closed citadel with a, with a giant wall on the outside, you know, to climb over. And Instagram has allowed not only to reach those things, but, you know, there's a lot of collectors who follow my work through Instagram that, Otherwise, in the past, would have had to go to the gallery and find it. And now they're, they can see it directly through, um, th- through my lens. The other huge benefit of it, as I see for an artist, is um, when I look at artists from the past and I am trying to form a picture of their complete universe, um, you know, even art- artists like Warhol, who you know, so much has been documented and written about, there are certain aspects of you know his life that we, we don't understand and that we, we don't have information of. There's other artists that were much more um, sort of closed in their um, in their lives who we really don't have a clear picture of. And I feel that I am able to use Instagram to also showcase other parts of my experience, um, of things that I'm interested in outside of you know making sculpture and painting and, and, and whatever other mediums. And I think that. For audiences, it kind of humanizes the work and, and it, it actually makes it easier to understand it uh, in a lot of ways. Daniel, was there a breakout moment in your career, a moment that was very obvious to both you and those around you that things were about to go to the next level? I mean, the Merce Cunningham thing, I would say was an early on one that um, certainly made a number of um, people outside Miami and, and outside the, the smaller circle that I was involved in aware of the work. Um, I think other sort of big pivotal moments, um, you know, in the in the more like pop uh, cultural world, I did a collaboration with Pharrell Williams in 2012. That was a huge moment. And the event with, from it, I can still remember, like, it was something it felt like something had changed that night um and then there have been other exhibitions i had a major exhibition um in atlanta at the high museum which was the first um i would say large-scale u.s uh museum solo exhibition Mm -hmm. um and then some of the collaborations you know with adidas with dior obviously the Dior, the collaboration with Kim Jones for Dior was also a huge thing for me. Um, also, you know, it's totally outside of my wheelhouse um, working in, in fashion in that way, but um, also just really fun, <laughs> you know, to work on that project with him. Um, so I was in it. So basically when you, I guess, like, forgive my ignorance here, but like, you know, we've had uh, cause ignorance when it comes to like art history, cause I haven't really ha- had too much, you know, time to educate myself on that stuff. But I've taken that like art history classes in college and, um, you know, in different eras, like you have the Renaissance era and you have this era and that era, you kind of, you can kind of like the art shows what the era was like in, in many ways. Right. And so right now we're in this like contemporary time when, you know, the art is kind of, it seems like it's like all over the place where like you can't, I guess looking back, maybe you can tell like what the art said about the times now, but how long do you think this era like lasts? Um, like, is that, do you think something crazy has to happen for like us to like move in a different direction like when it comes to like how art is even made or consumed or conceived or it's it's a weird question to ask because but it's like i'm just you know having these different periods i i think it's impossible certainly for artists but even you know writers and curators to identify a period while you're in it right um it's like trying to like identify like a zeitgeist uh, which is something impossible to identify, you right? You have to just like feel it. Um, and it, you, you know, you reference like the Renaissance or like neoclassical period, like those were, you know, h- hundreds or multi hundred year periods, which we now collapse into a single idea 
but actually there was many like smaller sort of movements within that. And even if we look, you know, in the last century, um, I would say like, you know, following World War I, we had Dada, and then following World War II, we had Surrealism, and then Abstract Expressionism, and then Land Art in the 70s, and then, you know, Pop Art, and uh, things happening with Warhol and Keith Haring, you know, it, it's a kind of rolling idea that we kind of encapsulate uh, into one phrase at a later date. Right. So in 100 years from now, we can look back at this period and sort of identify what it what it was and what it meant. Right, because isn't contemporary just like in that moment? I mean, like back then, contemporary was whatever was happening in that exact moment. But looking back, right, when we're, you know, let's say in 2040, what do you think this period of time is going to be called, right? I mean, if you were to right. put on your predictor hat and say, this is what I think it's going to be called, what, what is this moment in time? What is this period? Well, it depends on which period you're talking about and from whose perspective, right? Your perspective from 2020 to 2020, sorry, 2000 to 2020. Oh, 2000 to 2020. I mean, you guys are probably at least similar in age to me. And I think that our youth, the world felt a little bit more stable, at least certainly in the 90s, right? And I think since um, since 9-11, I feel like, the world has been in much more upheaval and all of that sort of idea around um, things that we could count on feel much more chaotic. Right. And that is certainly influence influencing the art that gets made um, through those periods. Um, but that's perspective from, you know, a white male New Yorker right. living, you know, uh, in, in this period, Versus somebody, you know, who's uh, living, you know, in Ghana or somebody like living in Baghdad right now. It's a whole other uh, kind of universe. And I think it's impossible to quantify in that right. way. You know, but it's a very, sorry, Pat, but I, I think it is a very interesting time because, you know, in that almost two decades, right? So me and Pat were both born in 1992. Uh, but, you know, we remember the 90s and what that looks like, but also, you know, as a result of things that happened post 9-11, all the wars, all the turmoil, but also on the flip side, all the technology, right? The, yeah. the, or social media or media in general, you know, it's brought the world closer together. It's, it's given people from a different perspective, you know, and it allowed them to see other perspectives. Back then, we didn't really know what people outside of our own state or our own country were thinking because yeah. by the time information traveled, it might have been another year. Right. I mean, b before then it was even that. Right. So everything is a lot faster now. Right. Art is faster. Fashion is faster. Food is faster. Right. For me, when I think back on this period of time, I think it's going to be like fast art. Right. It's like you have these canvas art people. You have people just producing things just quickly. Right. Just to turn things around. And mm. yes, I think it's created, you know, more artists and more opportunities. But has it diminished the quality of work? Perhaps. I'm not sure. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting because you brought up, I mean, this is something we talked about with Ronnie too, is this like concept of how like nostalgia and like the 90s era and the 80s era like plays in so many things today, whether it's art, clothing, I mean, culture and anything really. And I noticed the stormtrooper in the back there from Star Wars and like obviously, you know, Star Wars has been so incredibly instrumental and in, like, I mean, just George Lucas is a genius in my opinion, just like you know what he's created but i'm just kind of curious like is there anything in particular that you i guess have identified with the most in your childhood in your life like from a piece of work or a person that you look up to like one that is like i guess transcends everything everything else or is it just a culmination of everything yeah hard to identify like a single a single creator um but I think there was like an innocence to some of those, um, some of those films and, and you know television that um, feels a little bit lost now, right? Um, we, even if we think about like you know a, a more contemporary show that I think is amazing, like Stranger Things, it's like pretty dark and um, has a, a whole other like lens to it. Whereas if you compare that to something like Star Wars. I mean, it's like so PG, right? Yeah, <laughs> in relation. 
I literally wa- so I just watched Lord of the Rings for the first time. Um, I know I'm late, but I just watched it for the first time, and I've I've always been a huge Star Wars fan. But I was like, wow, this is so much more like dark yeah. compared to like Star Wars. Like you know, when you really watch it now, even the newer ones, it's like it's made for kids. You know, it's not really. But even though adults can appreciate it, it's made for kids. But other things, right. like even Stranger Things, like you said, it is. Yeah, that that dark element is interesting where they're kind of trying to cater to everybody now and not just kids, I guess. Even even like I watched like a Pixar movie recently, Soul. And 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 Pixar has always been like directed at kids and I was watching I'm like if I'm I'm like 28 years old, I can barely like that thing was complex. Very complex, like deep, very yeah. deep. Yeah. Uh Daniel, yeah. I'm curious, you know, more recently I know you you're doing that collaboration with uh the Cleveland Cavaliers. I know that's your hometown. How did all that come about? I know uh, Ronnie was doing the one with the Knicks. I know there's a few others as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll just take a minute to throw a little bit of shade on Ronnie because Ronnie just des- just designed the jerseys. I'm I'm the creative director of the Cavs, mm. and I'm, and I'm also a team partner. So wow. I, I'm the owner of the team as well. Oh wow! So that came about, you know, obviously I've had an interest in basketball. Um, it's figured prominently in my work as well. Um, and a couple of years ago I was commissioned to create a new artwork uh, for the arena when they renovated it. This is rocket mortgage um, field house in Cleveland. And, uh, the, uh, Gilbert family who commissioned that work and, you know, had, had already owned a number of my, of my pieces. Um, we just started a discussion after we unveiled that piece. There was a lot of interest. People obviously knew that I was from Cleveland and we sort of discussed like, you know, was there any other opportunity that I could do with the team? And as we started discussing it, it sort of evolved into this like complete creative direction role, which in the NBA didn't really exist. Like teams don't have creative directors um, in that way. So it was kind of an invented position. But as the league evolves and, you know, basketball becomes such a, a bigger sport globally, um, I think it's kind of a natural evolution. Right. And it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty challenging project, <laughs> um, quite honestly, because it's, uh, you know, the league is, is um, just the way that they work because it, it, all of the things that you see on court, like aesthetically, so all the jerseys, the actual court design, all of the graphics and all that stuff. It's usually designed a year or two years in advance of us actually seeing it on court, you know, for practical reasons. And um, there's a lot there. You know, I had a, a meeting, a super interesting meeting with the entire creative team for literally the run of show of like one night at the arena. And you're talking about everyone. So like, forget about all the, you know, the basketball staff. That's like, they're doing their own thing. I'm just talking about the creative side of like bringing the experience of, of what we have at the arena from the lighting to like all of the concessions to the merch that we have in the shop to literally the, the core projections and the guy that does the run of show. Like it's, there's so many things involved in it. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm super excited about being able to influence that going forward. So we have a couple really big opportunities. You know, the, the all-star game is in Cleveland next year in 2022. Hopefully we'll all be out of COVID by then. It'll be the first, like, you know, major sporting event, um, I think, probably um, in, in 2022. And it's a, it's a big moment for us to also shine a light on Cleveland. And, it, you know, for me, really all the amazing things that are, that are happening there. How does yeah. that impact your personal brand, right? You know, working with, you know, a sports team like the Cavaliers or just even, you know, you know for a basketball team, you know, does that – I assume it positively impacts your other work, right? Just from a recognition point of view, but also from a creativity point of view. I mean, I think it's awesome. I think the, the reaction to it has obviously been super, super um, large and, and positive. Um, and it's not like, you know, a, a everyday job, you know, right. I'm, I'm, there's an existing on the ground creative team. It's really like trying to steer the ship in the right direction have some influence on creative input and also come up with ideas for new things that, that we can do to bring um, th- this kind of like amazing, you know, championship level basketball um, to our fans. I mean, I don't yeah. know if you watched the, uh, the Cavs Nets game the other day, but that was, if you, if you want to talk about like craft and art, and if we think about 
you know, craft is what we're expected to know how to do. And, and, and art is the unexpected use of that craft. I mean, Colin Sexton with 42 points uh, to win the game in double overtime. It's like you can't get better than that. Yeah. Um, one thing that is like is common across, I guess, so many people that we've interviewed on the show, you know, we've had creators like yourself and artists, but also founders and entrepreneurs and CEOs and what, what have you. And everyone at some point has to develop these leadership skills if they want to be able to manage people and work with people. And obviously it comes maybe more easier for some than others. How about for you? Like, I'm curious, like, did you have to develop those over time to be a leader? Like when you have your team around you and you know, for example, the creative team at the Cavs and then, you know, your team personally, um, has that been a struggle at all? Or, or is it something that you feel like you've had a good grip on? I've definitely spent a lot of time learning about that and, and, you know, trying to, to understand how to, to, to lead creative teams. And they're, they're very different. So the way that my studio is set up, I have um, a staff within my art studio um, that is administration. Um, I have a complete design department that does all the graphics and all of the exhibition design for, for all the projects, as well as production staff that's primarily assisting with the sculptural work. Um, the paintings I'm, I'm still doing by myself, but all of the sculptural work um, is produced um, with assistance. Then I have Snarkitecture architecture team, which is a whole separate business and entity. So that about uh, we're up to like 16 people now on, in the art studio, another 15 people at Snarkitecture, architecture. And there we have architects and designers um, who are leading projects. And in some cases in Snarkitecture, architecture, they may, there may be projects that, I don't have anything to do with the design aspect of it. I've built a language with, with my partner, Alex, and the rest of the team. And it's, it's evolved into a kind of set of codes that they're able to now design within. And then I have an additions company, both here and another one called Archive Editions, which is based in Asia, um, which has its own um, staff. And then the Cavs team, mm-hmm. which is, you know, 60-plus uh, um, people in our, in our design um, you know, a department and uh, all of those are very different roles. But, you know, I think that part of um, the idea of building a team is really formulating ways that those people can achieve their best work, like finding ways to encourage them, um, build confidence, you know, not micromanage every single aspect of it, mm-hmm. um, especially in, you know, within snark architecture and the design department. So it's a, it's a fine balance and something that I, you know, I'm, I still learn, I'm still learning about and, and trying to, to better. How do you find the time to do all of these things? I mean, like, even though you have these teams in place, at the end of the day, as an owner, as a leader, you're doing a lot more than you think you're going to do, even after you have a team of people doing stuff. How, how, how is your day broken up? I mean, what are you spending a lot of your time on now? Uh, and, and where do you self be in the next couple of, a couple of years? So since the beginning, when I finished school, I always showed up at the studio at 9 a.m. And I was there until at least six, if not after. And I've treated it kind of like a job, right? Um, An artist, I think, should have, you know, I keep saying this idea of like studio practice. It's like you go there and like you work and like not everything is going to leave the studio, right? Um, So typical, you know, typical day now, um, if I... If I get here uh, around nine, um, the rest of the staff arrives around 10 so that I have the first hour to kind of gather my thoughts or you know, work on whatever um, I'm going to be developing that day. Quite honestly, it, um, we just finished this big exhibition. So this where I was working heavily in, in studio practice, um, the last week has been like tons of interviews and Zoom calls and <laughs> all of this like pent up um, actual organizational type work for projects that are happening months from now or, you know, even into 2022. Um, but in, in any typical day, I'm moving between multiple uh, roles um, at the Cavs, at Snark Architecture, here in the studio, working on a painting, um, you know, consulting with the team on how to, like, flip a sculpture that weighs 500 pounds. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, like, creating art, I feel like, especially like abstract work and stuff that maybe isn't as like easily understanding and like people can maybe look at it and draw different conclusions for themselves. 
I feel like a lot of it has to do with being able to read between the lines of just the world and the way it works. Like it's not like you, you're, you're kind of just seeing maybe it's like, you know, relationships or uh, cult, like just culture, like just dynamics or like things that, you know, silver linings that stick out to you that maybe other people can't see, you know, things that I guess would inspire you to create what you do. How much of that is just you living your day, like a normal, like just living a day to day. And how much of it is you creating some sort of intervention? Like, for example, like seeking out, I don't know if it's reading stuff or consuming other things or shows or, you know, philosophy, like how much of that has to be done, I guess, for you personally? Um, and, and how much of it is just like your day to day? So I input a lot, right? I, I watch a lot of film. I read a lot. I listen, you know, typically if I'm working here in the studio, I'm listening to the radio, to, um, you know, podcasts or things like that. And my interests are vast. So, or, or varied, I would say. Um, and, you know, I know as much about sneakers as I do about like second century, like Roman, you know, uh, work. And I think that that sort of informs the decisions that I make within the studio and allows me to, or I try to allow myself to make work without really knowing what the end goal with it is all the time. Right. And I'm sort of to the point where, you know, I would say maybe 75% of the things that I actually make here in the studio end up leaving the studio. The other 25% either never leave or they, they turn into iterations that will then show up and work years later. Um, so not everything has to be a completed idea, right? It's, part of it is just using the work as a way to learn about what those things can mean or be about. Early on, you had talked about, you know, that for people that are really passionate or want to commit to something, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of practice to reach a level of, you know, success. And sometimes some people might not even get there. Um, and along the way, you make a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of things that you fail at. Um, what is one failure that comes to mind for you that had a positive impact long term? Mm. I mean, there there's certainly been individual artworks that were um, kind of accidents. I mean, in some ways, you know, the um, this is more of a of a sculptural idea of failure and something that led to um, a kind of iteration of work. But the whole concept around future relics was really about um, casting things in uh, geological materials. And part of the idea for that was trying to find ways where I could create an archaeology of the present. So could I take like a phone and a computer and like push it into the future? Um, and I wanted to do that not by taking these objects and sort of painting them to look old. I really wanted them to like be the things that they would become in a thousand years. So I thought about this idea of a material transformation. Like could I remake a, a Sony Walkman into volcanic ash or crystal. Um, but there was no real way to do that that I had learned in school, right? It was a lot about trial and error and experimentation. Um, and the, the type of erosion that you see in the process that I used to create that actually initially came about through an accident of a, a process accident um, where a, a, a wax that we used to seal the exterior of the molds had actually seeped inside and created a resist, which which allows that erosion to happen. Hmm. Um, that's more of a <laughs> of a, a sculptural failure than um, than another one. I was trying to think of. Um, but it's crazy how like the art process kind of dips into like science, science, and like the scientific process. Or I mean, obviously with architecture, it's a little bit different. Um, or sorry, sculpting is a little bit different. But yeah, it's it's fully like I think about it literally as alchemy. Like I'm taking one right. material and like trying to transform it into another one. And in fact, in a number of my works, I actually consult with a conservator about how, because I want these works to look like they're falling apart, but I don't actually want them to continue to do that, right? Right, right. <laughs> so there needs to be a stasis of um, uh, you know, permanence in the work. And I've, I've worked heavily with conservators um, who have advised me on the material makeup of these things so that they can function the way that I want them to. 
What's a dream that you've yet to achieve? I mean, if we talk about film, you know, I've, I've kind of dabbled in it a little bit. I created a series of films um, actually also called Future Relic, um, which were uh, initially intended to be a series of shorts that um, would be compiled into a longer film. Um, that desire to do that led to the production of these films, but uh, such a challenging, I think film is probably the most challenging thing that like anyone could ever make. And, you know, any, all of the directors who are able to achieve things like that, it's such an incredible thing. So cinema film is certainly something that, you know, I've, I've been interested in and I hope to return to it. I have a way. feeling that f- folks who are in cinema would probably look at you and be like, what you're doing <laughs> seems much more <laughs> complex and hard to do. So I guess from your perspective, what about film uh, makes it seem so complex that it's like. Tough? So if, if, if you think about film, it actually encompasses all of the things that I do plus the making of the film. Mm-hmm. So if we think, let's think about somebody, you know, one of my favorite uh, contemporary directors is Christopher Nolan. If oh, you yeah. think about, Um, what he does, he has to create all of the architecture, all of the set design, all of the photography, all of the costumes, all of the dialogue, the choreography of how people move through space. And he has to think about how the experience of watching a film can influence our perception of it. I mean, if, 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 uh, did you guys see Tenet? No, I know it's on my list. I got to watch it. I've seen every other movie of his pretty much. (laughs) This film, I've seen it like four or five times now. It's one of these films that you can watch and the film is kind of like, it's like an hourglass or something. Like you watch it once and then at the end of it, you're like, (laughs) I'd literally have to watch the whole thing again, knowing the perspective that the end, you know, shows you. I see. Um, It's such a complex thing. And it also, it's a film that the medium of watching it, the medium of film itself becomes part of the of the experience of it it's yeah. hard to describe what i mean by that but but i but i've heard that and too and and i've, I've wondered it's like every every time nolan makes a film it's just like crazier and crazier like inception was years ago and then this like this guy's gonna implode like he's just gonna like cause our brains to just like completely explode it's fucking crazy yeah, yeah. Anyway, when you're not working what are you doing i mean are you spending time with friends family talk to- I mean, I have two young boys, so, you know, um, I've been working on a project. I have a house out in Long Island, which is actually a historical piece of architecture designed um, in uh, the early 70s by Norman Jaffe, um, which I've done a complete restoration to. And I um, I found uh, some of his original drawings, which included uh, further plans, uh, an extension on that. So I'm looking into that. So I spend a lot of time, you know, on the, the architecture on the weekends. I have a garden out there that I that I tend to <laughs> as well. Um, big gardener. Not the gardening part, but the like <laughs> organizational part of you got it. Literally the placement of the rocks. There are got sculptures it. that I have out there where I'm testing um, the patina. Um, the uh, property is quite close to the ocean, so the salt um, air can age um, these sculptures in a different way. Um, you know, I like to drive a lot. You know. My love of Porsche is not, everyone, everyone kind of knows about that. So I usually have, you know, a car out there on the weekend um, with, with my boys. Nice, man. Love it. Well, this has been amazing. I, I mean, I've, I've just gone so much out of this. I can't thank you enough. We can't thank you enough uh, for hanging out with us and just sharing your story, but also like your wisdom and all the stuff that's in your, in your brain. Um, and we, I, I think we, I speak for all of us when I say we can't wait to see what you do next and, um, you know, all the best to you. I hope we can meet in person someday. Uh, this whole COVID thing obviously fucked things up, but uh, it'll yes. be nice to, yeah, connect. Oh, yeah, hopefully too. you and Ronnie could come out. We'll do like a live panel one day and you can, you know, throw some jabs in person if need be. As as, as long as the Cavs pe- uh, keep uh, beating the Knicks, I'm good. I mean, that, that might not be tough, right? I mean, uh, for, yeah. for, for, <laughs> well, we're, it sounds we're, like this is going to happen for sure. Yeah. We beat twice now and we beat them once, but it's all right. I mean, Colin Sexton has been uh definitely at the top of his game I mean, he's gonna be he's gonna be a talented player for sure for years to come yeah for sure definite all-star in the making but you guys definitely yeah. need another sort of you know figure to come help him out yeah we took the king but you know 
<laughs> he's got he's got to prove himself this year in a full season. Yep, yep. Well, cool, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, man.